Welcome, everyone. I am very excited to uh, uh, be a moderator here today and want to thank IFPRI for ho hosting this uh, important policy seminar entitled Toward Resilient Livelihoods, Food Security, and Nutrition for All, Confronting the Gendered Impacts of COVID-19. What a title, and what a way to begin a morning. My name is Greg Collins, and I'll serve as moderator today. I'm uh, the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID. I'm also the agency's resilience coordinator. So I come at this discussion and frankly, all discussions with resilience very much in mind. And that's a really important uh, uh, piece of what you'll be discussing here today. We all know over the last year, the impacts of COVID-19 on societies and economies have been profound. Um, and the more we learn, the more profound the impacts uh, are. And this is especially true in developing countries where safety nets are nascent or don't exist and the tipping point is shallow. And the shocks uh, of this magnitude simply overwhelm the capacity of households and communities to manage on their own. And so the full impact of the pandemic on economies and societies is still unfolding, but we've already seen the areas that are being hardest hit are those that are already experiencing hunger, poverty, and malnutrition even prior to uh, uh, the pandemic. And so sometimes there's a tendency to think about urban areas when we talk about the impacts of COVID-19, including the impacts on hunger, and those are real. But it's also very much true that rural populations, where, where the tipping point was extremely shallow, were heavily impacted. In fact, in, in many of the countries we care most about, um, the impact in terms of absolute numbers is actually greater in rural areas than in urban areas. So the, again, uh, it's impacting everywhere. Uh, but uh, rural areas being significantly impacted as well. And according to the latest impact, uh, impact estimates from the World Bank, it's estimated that the pandemic pushed about 124 million more people into poverty and chronic hunger in 2020. And even more concerning is that that number is projected to rise to about 163 million in 2021. So this isn't a quick hit and quick rebound. This is a lasting impact. And in fact, uh, the persistence of these impacts is projected to last out uh, all the way until about 2030 or, or beyond. So we also know uh, an important uh, aspect of the impact of COVID-19 is that it's widening the poverty gap. And uh, it's widening it between men and women. And it has a profound impact on inequality. And so we know for every 100 men aged 25 to 34 that are living in extreme poverty, there's about 118 women. And that gap is projected to increase. So not only are the impacts significant, they're exacerbating inequalities that already exist. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. COVID has really laid bare gender inequalities that women and girls face in many spheres. And that includes the labor market, education and secondary health out outcomes. And of course, something we're all deeply concerned about increase in gender-based violence. And that's just, again, the tip of the iceberg of the uh, gendered impacts. And these gender inequalities have ripple effects that are gonna make recovery and coming out of this uh, pandemic on the other side, much tougher and longer if we don't address them as part of the response, as part of the recovery, as part of building back toward a more resilient future. And we also know from, from our work at USAID on resilience that women's empowerment is a critically important source of resilience in its own right and helps explain why some households and communities fare better in the face of shock events than others. So the aim here cannot simply be to build back to a prior state of vulnerability. We need to build towards a more resilient future and empowering women has gotta be central uh, to that aim. Uh, and, and that we knew that before the pandemic and it's even, there's even a greater urgency about it now. So in terms of building towards that resilient future, what's it gonna take? We're gonna to have to invest in data-driven, gender-sensitive and transformative policies and programs that recognize and draw on women's leadership women's voice and participation as a source of recovery and resilience. And the discussion uh, in this panel today is our first step toward that vision. Some very exciting data is gonna be shared. We have a great panel of experts who are gonna share their insights from research on the impacts of COVID-19, specifically looking at rural men and women and how we can build towards a more equal resilient society. Before we start that, just a note, and I'll um, remind you several, several times throughout the session uh, today, that uh, you can please submit questions as we go. Uh, and you can do that on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag uh, askifpre on Twitter, and we'll address them in the question and answer period. So we're gonna run through the panel and we'll come back to the question and answer, answer period uh, at the end. Um, with that, I would, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the first panelist, 
is uh, Elizabeth Bryan. Elizabeth is a senior scientist in the Environment Production Technology Division at IFPRI, where she conducts policy relevant research on gender, sustainable agricultural production, climate smart agriculture, and small, small scale irrigation. She's also part of the USAID funded Gender Climate Nutrition Integration Activity, GCAN, uh, that conducted seven country panel surveys to identify and monitor the impact of pandemic on rural men and women. And it's going to share the results with that. Uh, uh, from their cross uh, country analysis. So very, uh, very uh, pleased to have Elizabeth on our panel. Elizabeth, over to you. Thanks so much, Greg, for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today to discuss the results of our phone surveys with men and women in rural areas of seven Feed the Future countries. I wanna thank the team of researchers working with us to collect and analyze the data across all of these countries. And I especially wanna thank Muzna Alvi, Shweta Gupta and Prabhti Barua for preparing all the data for this cross country analysis, which was a ton of work. Um, we will have a longer report coming out in the next several weeks on these results, as well as briefs with results for each of the countries separately. Next slide, please. So when we were designing this survey, we started with the conceptual framework that we developed for the Gender, Climate Change and Nutrition Integration Initiative or GCAN, which Greg mentioned, um, which highlights the gender dimensions of climate shocks and stressors. But this framework can also be applied to think through the gendered impacts of other types of shocks and stressors. So we applied this framework to think through the impact pathways through which COVID-19 can affect rural women and men. We then developed a phone survey questionnaire to explore these various dimensions. In particular, we asked about the direct impacts of COVID-19, including has a household lost income due to COVID-19 and whose income was affected. We asked about changes in migration status of household members and the effect on remittances that these members send back. We asked about changes in labor allocation among members within the household to do various everyday activities. We asked about um, changes in men's and women's mobility, changes in the care burden of men and women, impacts on food insecurity and dietary diversity, and intra-household conflict. And we also asked about existing resilience capacities, especially the WASH environment, and track changes in this over time. We also included a module on coping strategies to deal with income losses. And importantly, we ask about who in the household is implementing these coping strategies to understand the gendered implications of them. Next slide, please. So we implemented the survey in seven different countries that are shown in the table here. The timeline for implementation varied across countries, as you can see. Uh, we selected countries where we had data from previous face-to-face -face surveys that had included phone numbers of the respondent. And the sampling frame for each country was based on the original survey data. So these vary, but all focused on rural households. None of the samples are nationally representative, but were carried out in selected districts within each country within the Feed the Future zone. Then within each country and within each sample, we selected a random subset of 500 households from the original survey and interviewed women in half of the households and men in the other half. We then followed the same respondent across rounds. Some modifications were made to the core questionnaire in different countries and to the sampling approach as well. Uh, for example, in Senegal, the sample includes mainly male and female heads of household rather than spouses. As you can see from the table, the surveys are still ongoing in every country with one to two rounds yet to be implemented. And because this is a lot of data today, I'm presenting a summary of the cross country results for a selected set of indicators, focusing on the first and last rounds that were implemented in these countries. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna move right into the results. Um, one of the main impacts of the pandemic that we found, not surprisingly, is income loss. Um, a large share in each country reported income losses due to the pandemic. However, we see that respondents in most countries who are more likely to experience income losses at the start of the pandemic, so the first survey round, compared to the last survey round. The only exception is in Niger, where households were more likely to report income losses during the last survey round. So this was February compared to October. 
So this suggests that generally conditions are changing in most countries that allow households to resume economic activities to some degree and or that households are adjusting their livelihood activities following the initial shock of the pandemic. We're presenting household level data here rather than a breakdown by men and women because this particular question was asked about household level income. However, there were some slight differences in some countries between men and women in their perceptions of income losses that we can see when we look at their responses by male and female respondents. Next slide, please. When we asked about whose income was affected, we see differences across countries and also over time. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance here in these results. In Ghana, for example, more women than men were more likely to report that their own income was affected during the first survey round. But by the last survey round in Ghana, the share of men reporting income losses increased while women's share fell. In Kenya, the share of both men and women reporting that their own income was affected increased in the last survey round, although the increase was more dramatic for men. In Nepal and Niger, more uh, men were more likely than women to report that their own income was affected in both rounds, while in Uganda, the opposite was true. Women were more likely to report that their own income was affected in both rounds. In Nigeria, the share of both men and women reporting that their own income was affected fell in the second round. And in Senegal, the share of men reporting income losses remained consistent, but the share of women reporting that their own income was affected increased in the last survey round. Next slide, please. So we looked at coping strategies as well, and use of savings as a coping strategy seems to have declined between the first and last rounds in most countries, except Niger and Ghana. So this suggests that households are depleting savings first when confronted with the shock of COVID-19. Since income shocks in Niger seem to have increased from a lower level in the first round, it's not surprising that we see more households reporting using savings in the last round because they may not have been depleted already. In Ghana, income shocks did not decline much in the last round and it appears that households are still drawing down savings in this round. Next slide, please. When we asked about whose savings were used, we find that men were more likely to report that their own savings were used in most countries. Women were slightly more likely to report that they used their own savings in Senegal and Uganda only. In Ghana, where use of savings increased between the first and last round, we see these increases affecting both men's and women's savings. And in Niger, where use of savings as a strategy also increased in the last round, we see that men's savings continued to be drawn down at a higher rate than women's, perhaps because women's savings were already depleted or low to begin with. In Kenya and Nepal, where respondents reported less use of savings between rounds, we see that savings shift from more women's savings being used in the first round to an increase in men's savings being used in the last round. So this suggests that, uh, again, women's savings were drawn down first and potentially depleted in these countries. Next slide, please. As with using savings, selling assets, assets increases as a coping strategy among respondents in Niger and Ghana from the first to the last round. It also increases in Nepal where use of savings declined between rounds. So this suggests that households in Nepal are shifting strategies from using savings to now selling assets. Even though use of savings declined in some countries, selling assets remained an important strategy in Senegal, Nigeria, and Uganda across both rounds. So again, this finding suggests that as savings get depleted, selling assets remains or becomes a more important coping response to dealing with persistent income losses as a result of the pandemic. Next slide, please. In terms of selling assets, men were more uh, generally more likely to report that their own assets were sold, except in Uganda, where women were more likely to report that their assets were sold in both rounds. Um, in the last slide, we saw that asset sales were increasing from the first to the last survey round. And here we see that this is driven by an increase in the sale of both men's and women's assets across most countries. And this is true, especially for women, where we see women's asset sales increasing between the first and the last rounds in six out of seven countries. Next slide. Borrowing money also remains an important coping strategy across all countries. Similar to the case with selling assets, the importance of borrowing actually increased over time in several countries, including Ghana, Niger, Nigeria, and Senegal. 
And we also asked about whether the households received transfers from governments or NGOs. Um, the results are not shown, but what we found was that very few households received support from the government or NGOs to address COVID-19, um, except in Senegal where um, so many respondents did report receiving government support. Next slide, please. So we also asked about food security changes as a result of the pandemic. Our data show that worry about food remains high in many countries with more than 50% of men and women in almost all countries worried that they would not have enough food to eat. Women were generally more likely to worry that they would not have enough food, but the worry was also high among men. Um, here we can see that this worry about food seems to be attributed to COVID-19. Uh, Respondents in countries that were more worried about food also reported that access to food changed as a result of COVID-19. And when we asked respondents about how their food access changed, some of the most common responses that we heard were that they were unable to obtain enough food, that they ate less food, and to a lesser degree that they got food from different sources or that they ate different foods. Next slide, please. So food access changes as a result of COVID-19 are particularly troubling in countries where women do not have adequate diets. Here we can see that the share of women with adequate diets, meaning that they consumed at least five out of 10 food groups in the last 24 hours is particularly low in Kenya, Niger and Senegal in the second round. Um, in the other countries, at least 50% of women are consuming an adequately diverse diet. Next slide. So given the importance of hand washing to prevent the spread of COVID-19, we also asked how frequently have you or anyone in your household had to go without washing hands after dirty activities because of problems with water. And so in this slide, essentially the green is good. It means respondents never had to go without washing hands after dirty activities like going to the bathroom or changing diapers. The countries where we do see some challenges in accessing water are Ghana especially, um, but also to some degree in Niger, Nigeria, Senegal, and Uganda, where between 20% to one third had more limited access to water for hand washing. And this is obviously a key factor that increases the risk of disease in these countries and, and needs to be addressed. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, we see that income shocks due to the pandemic are also pervasive in rural areas. So it's not just a, an urban problem. The trends vary across countries with some experiencing more severe impacts at the start of the pandemic, others experiencing greater income shocks later in the year and others where income shocks remained high. Um, both men and women are experiencing these income shocks and there are no sort of obvious trends across countries in terms of who is affected more. You really have to dig deeper into the nuanced results. And we can dig deep deeper into this data to explore income losses by different occupations of men and women each, in each country. And we can include these results in our longer report. Um, when we look at coping responses, we generally see a shift from heavier use of savings at the start of the pandemic to more sales of assets and borrowing later on. Both in men and women are found to be co um, contributing to these coping responses. However, there are lots of differences across countries in terms of how they contribute uh, to deal with income losses and how these uh, trends change over time. So more research really needs to be done on the long-term impacts of the loss of savings, uh, the depletion of assets and the indebtedness as a result of this pandemic. And as Greg mentioned, it's gonna take you know, a decade for us to be able to dig out of the lasting impacts of this. We also found, oh, sorry, next slide, please. <clears throat> we also found that uh, food access was affected by the pandemic and worry about food was high, especially among women, but also men. Um, dietary adequacy was particularly low in Niger and declining in Senegal. Um, changes in food access due to the pandemic are particularly worrisome in these contexts. We also found a very poor Bosch environment in Northern Ghana, especially, but also some problems with water access in the other countries that may contribute to risk of COVID-19 infection. Uh, next slide, please. So the other panelists are gonna get into this more in terms of the policy interventions that can address some of these impacts of the pandemic. Uh, 
Um, but what our data suggests is that men and women in rural areas also need relief to address income shocks and food insecurity challenges. And these may include relief, uh, food relief, credit provision, and asset building programs so that we can build back better um, following this pandemic. Um, such programs should be targeted to women, especially in places where women's income losses are high and or women's savings and assets are being drawn down. And having data on the extent to which women's savings are being used, women's assets are being drawn can help us better target these programs. We also need to invest in improving the WASH environment to prevent the risk of disease now and in the future. Thank you very much for listening and I'll pass it back over to Greg. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was fantastic. I mean, you just demonstrated the power of panel data following households over time. That is the true way we get at measuring resilience in the moment and really some powerful insights, both in terms of um, the different way this is unfolding in different countries, as well as between men and women. I really think that data highlights this, this really dangerous spot we're in right now, this downward spiral where uh, depleting savings, depleting assets, and that is going to make this harder to dig out of. I remember years ago, a guy named uh, Alain de Janvre was uh, promoting emergency credit as a potential solution for dealing with shock events, and certainly this points to that type of thing as well. So thank you so much uh, for that. Wonderful. I want to invite everybody uh, to please submit questions uh, on Elizabeth's presentation and the ones that are going to follow here. You can do so on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or by using the hashtag AskIfpre on Twitter. And we'll get to those in the Q&A. But next, I'm going to turn to Patricia Vandeveld. Patricia has worked in the World Bank's agriculture global practice for 10 years on gender innovation uh, in agricultural systems, agricultural public, public expenditure. And she's the gender lead for the food and ag agricultural practice since 2017. So delighted to have you here with us, Pat Patricia. And she's going to speak about the World Bank's response to the pandemic in their operations within the ag sector and how gender consi uh, considerations were integrated into those efforts, just as Elizabeth, Elizabeth's data uh, suggests they absolutely should be. Over to you, Patricia. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Greg, and thank you everyone for having me. Um, full disclosure, uh, I'm not a researcher. I don't do the research, so I won't present uh, such as Elizabeth does all these findings. I'm also not on the forefront of the World Bank operations, putting all these into, into place. Um, I'm Patricia Vandervelde, I'm the gender focal point, and I feel like I, the best way to describe my job and role and a little bit what I'll touch upon is as the middle woman uh, between research and data and operations. Um, so that's really what I want to present uh, on here today, not so much what we find, what we found in terms of gender inequalities, but rather what we do once we do know about them. When we find the gender inequalities, when we, when we look at them, how do we go forward? How do we leverage investment to get to women and to change uh, something for the for going forward? Next slide, please. Uh, so, as it was, when we all kind of sort of figured, even initially when the pandemic hit, we, we figured that women would be disproportionately hit, even without the data and the correct information. We were working off what we knew from Ebola and other public health emergencies that women suffer disproportionately vis-a-vis -vis men. We were also cobbling this together with what we knew and what we'd learned from food price crisis in terms of food security um, and how women were affected there. So we're just trying to put these all together. So I'll detail a little bit in my, in my presentation first, how we were monitoring this, how we were trying to get to all the information and then what sources we were using. I'll go a little bit how the way we leveraged data and information led to better responses and how we are then able to really uh, uh, have a specific gender focus in our responses due to the process. So next slide, please. So basically the, and again, I, I'm mostly focusing on agriculture and food security as that's sort of my job, but it does go to rural resilience a little bit as well. But in terms of food security, we were in sort of the, the early stages. We cobbled together this huge team across the bank and it really brought together a, a, a sort of a, a very diverse um, group of people to try and get this accurate picture. So we were bringing together data on food prices, but also data on trade and movement. Uh, we were looking at, we were getting information from country offices on policy changes. We were trying to map as well, um, not only inflation, but looking at uh, 
well, what the private sector was doing, what, and we were looking at different areas that had to do with food security, not just nutrition and poverty, but really where all of the different sectors came in. So this created a very, over the first couple of weeks, a very vibrant brief, and we kept adding to it as we mobilized to get more information. So we also had the World Bank phone surveys that, that were referenced before that were done by the Poverty GP, the LSMS data, which sort of was retooled to focus on the COVID-19 uh, aspects. We also used our Earth Observatory um, to get weather data, also look at where that was going to affect our crops and prices, uh, really using all types of quantitative and qualitative data to get this picture uh, of what the food security situation was happening and to be able to identify preemptively and sort of very proactively where there were going to be issues in terms of food supplies and food access. Next slide, please. Uh, so the food security brief, which had all this information and still does sort of, it's a very internal management driven piece. It is an information piece, but it really acted as a catalyst within the World Bank group and also within our, our funding environment um, to really remain focused and vigilant on food systems as one of the, the areas beside health that was going to be a, a big part of, of resilience and the ability to go forward after the pandemic and during the pandemic. So having this, Compilation of very diverse data provided a solid basis to leverage funding. Um, next slide, please. Um, which we were able to do through gathering, these are sort of the, some of the ideas, the phone surveys, the SMS data, but also partner uh, information. We weren't sort of like World Bank only. We used a lot of uh, market information, hotspots on famines from WFP. Uh, everything got lumped into this. Next slide, please. Um, and so really to be able to get um, enough validation, but also sort of imperative to get funding for uh, addressing not just our immediate big funding, which envelopes, which were for health and for dealing with the health emergencies and testing, uh, but also public infrastructure for health and cash transfers, but really also dealing with food security and really being able to project that we would have um, long-term impacts on food security if we didn't act immediately and not just in terms of providing uh, on-the-spot food assistance. So uh, the World Bank responses uh, in the agriculture sector were um, a lot of our projects have emergency funds. A lot of those were activated uh, to deal with, um, to deal with um, the food security needs of the very specific given countries. Um, additional IDA funding was released just for food security. Um, projects that were in the pipeline pivoted to be able to deal with very specific in-country problems, either uh, they were value chain problems or domestic supply routes or food security issues due to income losses due to exports not happening. So they're very specific and tailored and this was gathered in the brief and we were able to leverage a ton of funding. So some of these examples, um, of the country uh, projects and pivots were uh, strengthening uh, commercial food supply chains for employment uh, in Afghanistan, for example, and in Haiti, uh, because of the reduction in remittances, uh, th that was more of the focus was on providing really cash transfers there. In Kenya, there was much more uh, input problems that we were noticing on the ground for, for for food production, so we leverage digital technologies with, with partnerships and startups for uh, soil testing, inputs, credit, extension advice, market linkages uh, in that situation. In the Kyrgyz, there's an example I really liked of really tailoring it, a food security project, um, was leveraging the capacity of water user associations to distribute agricultural inputs, because that's what we had on the ground. So um, there's some really great examples. See, in Rwanda, it was, uh, maintaining current levels of exports uh, to support cooperation of horticulture growers um, because of air freight and logistics costs due to COVID-19. So very tailored, but focused on the food system. Um, and in Tajikistan, for example, cash transfers to food insecure households with children on the age of two uh, to mitigate against what we saw were rising food prices uh, and sort of nutrition. Next slide, please. Now, most of you uh, know, uh, especially if you're here today, the Gender Innovation Lab, and this is really where we're getting to the gender part. So the Gender Innovation Lab is a key partner of mine as they 
uh, besides the whole World Bank group data and information that we have, like women business and the law and development economics, uh, the World Bank Gender Innovation Network works a lot, in, in this case, the Africa one, uh, on finding solutions and really innovating and tailoring uh, to change the effectiveness of, of our gender interventions. So at this point, we have all the data and I was harnessing all the information and then bringing in the Gender Innovation Lab and my colleagues from there, uh, we were able to sort of say like, okay, we have this whole menu and set array of gender outcomes that are that are worse uh, in the COVID-19, especially in food security, especially within the food system. And we have some solutions. How is the best way to do them? How do we maximize uptake of extension, for example? How do we get cash transfers to actually reach not just households, but women? How would we increase uh, uptake of land cycling? Basically, the, the jill is there to make it work. So bringing in all these different pieces is crucial to, to getting the right gender <laughs> um, aspect into food security investment. Next slide, please. So basically what a Gender Innovation Lab colleague and myself did was put together really rapidly uh, this piece where we're just sort of kitchen sink of women in the food system, producers, consumers, job holders, food sellers, critical points, and basically tried to map through all of their work and their experience, um, all of their evidence and the data we had, as many interventions as possible that could possibly work. So we have, for example, one of the problems is women farmers, uh, less access, uh, and made worse. So what would be some of the measures that we, we, would, we would recommend that you could tailor? Uh, so organize transport, make digital markets platforms, leverage local networks of female farmers that already exist at community le level, uh, set up collection and distribution points. These are all sort of examples that we try to put in and be as broad as possible. Next slide, please. So um, some of the gender uh, in the response to some examples, a lot of it was uh, in immediately, and it sort of said um, governments like it, is this idea of kitchen garden. So in Pakistan, as part of the, the food security response, 18,000 female head of households were given uh, small projects on livestock and agricultural activities, including kitchen gardens. Um, in Afghanistan, the kitchen gardening scheme, if as part of the horticulture project, really uh, increased and they put a ton of investment into there. Um, and we also sort of really leveraged what we had already invested in, and that's with some of the positive side. For example, the fact that uh, we had invested over 15 years in women's self-help groups and communities and, and um, organization of women in India was really leveraged as we tried to do food distribution, as cash transfers tried to get out, as funding and financing needed to be organized, but also food distribution. So leveraging incredible points of resilience in communities that we had already invested in was, was a great example. And we, the India example is the most famous one, but we were seeing it all over Africa as well, where women's co-ops were leveraged for uh, distribution points, for continued um, uh, crop uh, inputs, uh, and uh, for also for, for collection and, and markets. Next slide, please. Uh, so, but we also, in some of these responses, we also highlighted some of the really systemic and sort of problem areas that we have already, even as we try to do the responses. For example, in one project where we tried to do cash transfers, immediate assistance to poultry farmers, um, we know that a lot of them were women, but because of the way they were all registered, it was a head of household registration, and it turned out that most of these were men, and we couldn't sex disaggregate it. So presumably a lot of the money went to men, whereas they may not be the best, they may not be the farmer or the poultry raiser and make the best decisions about uh, the, the production. So that's one problem, uh, the, the sort of this idea that we have uh, institutions that still have male uh, or men as heads of household. Uh, and sometimes it's against the law for a woman to be a head of household if there is a husband. Um, we have a digital divide still, so we have digital responses, but women may, may definitely have less uh, access to mobile technology than men do. Um, we have less use of financial instruments. Women are very undercapitalized, so even as we try and put out financial instruments, they have to be in the system to be able to get them. Next slide, please. I'm racing at the end. <laughs> and then, but so to build back better, it is to look at some of these issues that did come up while we tried to do gender responses, what was holding us back? Sometimes it was the data. Sometimes it's really the, the, the constraints at institutional and regulatory level, such as land titling or laws or 
uh, registration or the invisibility of women as farmers that held us back from being able to do long-term uh, investments in women's resilience and their ability to produce still uh, on the farm. So that's, I think, where we uh, really need to focus in the future is not only on the responses to food security and community resilience, but what makes uh, a woman an integral part and a recognized part of the food system that they can continue in the future uh, to be resilient to food uh, and other shocks. I raised at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, and I'll get to you in the question. No, that was great, Patricia. You did race at the end, but you got a lot in there and there was a lot to uh, take in and some wonderful insights. Um, I think we've been talking about food systems before the pandemic hit with the, the big event later this year, but wow, this event really showed what it looks like when a shock reverberates through a food system and how it impacts people in that food system differently, including uh, women and men differently. So very much appreciate the insights and look forward to the Q&A around, around those intervention areas, which you highlighted, which were so, so important. Uh, so now we are going to turn to, well, before I turn to Megan, I am once again going to remind you all, if you have questions, please uh, shoot them to us on ifpre.org, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, or the hashtag AskIfpre. I've seen some of the Q&A coming in, some great questions, but please make sure yours gets in there so we can ask it. Uh, and we'll come back to that after we uh, hear from Megan O'Donnell, who is the Assistant Director for Gender and a Senior Policy Analyst at the Center for Global Development where she leads the organization's COVID-19 Gender and Development Initiative. Megan will share some of the policy priorities emerging from the initiative's research and some of the analysis they've done to date. Uh, Megan, over to you. Thanks so much, Greg. And thanks to my fellow panelists, to Elizabeth and Patricia for their really rich uh, intervention so far. Um, following Patricia's really in-depth analysis of what the World Bank has done to pivot its operations to promote resilience in rural areas, uh, this presentation is going to zoom out to provide a broader overview of what both governments and a handful of other donor institutions are doing in response to some of the impacts that Elizabeth detailed in terms of food insecurity, lost income, and depleted savings, and the extent to which those institutions and policymakers are prioritizing a gender lens in those efforts. I'll note for context that the work I'm presenting uh, is in partnership with other CGD researchers, Myra Buvinich, Charles Kenny, Shelby Borgo, and George Yang, uh, all of whom fall under this COVID-19 gender and development initiative that we launched early this year. And next slide, please. To give you a bit of context on the initiative before diving into the specific analysis on agricultural policy response efforts, um, two overarching goals. First is just to make sure that gender equality is top of mind as decision makers seek to respond to the COVID crisis and recover from it. Um, and secondly, of course, as, as a think tank like IFPRI, uh, we seek to generate rigorous data and evidence that can serve as a resource to then inform evidence-based decision-making of these actors. We're focused on three thematic areas, uh, women's economic empowerment, social protection, both of which obviously have implications for the discussion today, uh, as well as the indirect health impacts of the crisis. So thinking of things like sexual and reproductive health and rights, maternal health care, and gender-based violence, and asking questions around the extent to which uh, the pandemic has exacerbated some of the challenges in accessing essential uh, health services. I will focus on the first two. Uh, and since Elizabeth has done such a great job of, of sort of outlining the gendered impacts of the crisis, um, and as I said, as Patricia has, has done the deep dive on the World Bank in the next slide, I will now focus on policy response by governments. So here we rely heavily on the COVID-19 gender response tracker uh, that's put together by the UNDP and UN Women. And you can see on the left side here, out of over 2,500 uh, different policy measures that this tracker documents, just how few are actually gender sensitive. So aside from where you see at the bottom there, violence against women oriented policy measures, uh, which the tracker sort of takes at face value to be gender sensitive, understandably so. When we look at social protection, labor market, 
economic and fiscal policies, we see that less than 20%, just around 17% of all of these measures are deemed gender sensitive. Now we do a deeper dive into the labor market measures uh, to sort of thematically code them, uh, to get a sense for the extent to which they're targeting certain parts of the economy, uh, certain types of workers, entrepreneurs, or farmers. And as you can see then on the right, the vast majority of the labor market measures that the tracker reflects as gender sensitive are targeting support at micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises, as well as cooperatives. Um, much, much less emphasized in the tracker's data uh, have been government's efforts to target agricultural sector work. Uh, so just about 6% of the gender sensitive measures are focused within the agricultural sector. Though I should note, of course, that as governments are targeting things like financial and digital inclusion, or even support to MSMEs and cooperatives, it's possible um, that farmers and others working in agriculture are benefiting, uh, but that's not explicitly stated as sort of the policy priority of these governments. Next slide, please. So here you can see the breakdown uh, in even clearer terms, as I mentioned, that out of the 2,500 plus policy responses reflected in this tracker, You've got just 69, so just about 3%, less than 3% of these measures have an explicit agriculture component. Of those, just 12 are targeting women's economic security or deemed gender sensitive, and just nine are located in low or middle income country settings. Next slide, please. Now, on the donor institution side, we don't have a comparable resource like the UNDP or UN Women Tracker. So our team at CGD has gotten the ball rolling. We've, we've needed to start from scratch. And what we did in the first instance was to look across new projects uh, that have been approved starting in March of 2020 through December 31st of 2020 across the World Bank, as well as the Asian Development Bank and the African Development Bank. We find 195 projects approved since March uh, across those three institutions. And not surprisingly, the vast majority of those projects are focused on the direct health effects of the COVID pandemic. Uh, we find much fewer, 60 in fact, uh, that have an economic relief um, or recovery component. Of those, we found project appraisal documents or the equivalent uh, for 48 projects. So that enabled us to go in to the weeds of those projects' designs, uh, look at the extent to which their results frameworks, for example, include gender-specific indicators or targets. And we find encouragingly that across the three multilateral development banks that, that served as our initial sample, the vast majority of projects do in fact include some form of sex disaggregated data in their indicators. Um, and many of these are also setting targets that are gender specific. Although notably, as you can see at the very bottom on the left, much fewer of these are at parity. So calling for women to be 50% or more of the beneficiaries of projects. On the right, you can see what we've done mirrors what we did with the UNDP UN Women Tracker data. And that was to map sort of thematically or across different sectors and parts of the economy, uh, what types of gender specific indicators are being integrated into projects. And you can see a lot of overlap here in donor investments and in projects where the vast majority uh, of these indicators are focused on MSME financing and other forms of support. Um, encouragingly across the MDBs, we do see a little bit more uh, attention to the agricultural sector specifically. Uh, so right, right around 17%. Next slide, please. This goes into a little bit more detail um, of the specific projects and indicators across the three donor institutions that were our initial sample. Uh, you see that both the World Bank and Asian Development Bank uh, composed right around 38% of the gender specific indicators and targets that we find. Uh, African Development Bank came in third with, with 
I should note, however, how small our, our initial sample is. So this does not constitute a huge amount of countries in this first instance. This is Afghanistan, Cameroon, the CAR, Grenada, Myanmar, Nepal, Rwanda, and the Solomon Islands, where we find projects with publicly available documentation and gender-specific indicators and targets. So of course, we'll continue to sort of update these analysis as more projects become available to review. Um, but it also stands to reason that obviously there's, there's more to be done from a gender-specific uh, perspective in agriculture across these institutions. And then on the right, you can see where the gender-specific targets break down. Uh, I mentioned just several of them came in at parity. Uh, whereas the vast majority tend to hover around 30% women as an inclusion target. Next slide, please. And then here is a snapshot of, in light of that analysis, what we hope going forward will be done in COVID response and recovery uh, to promote women's economic uh, empowerment and opportunities, both in rural areas and more broadly. And I'd, I'd look forward to being able to discuss further uh, as we go into Q&A, but just to give a quick snapshot now, I think as much as we are learning and as much great data and evidence is available, there are clearly still blind spots and gaps that we need to address. Um, for example, reaching those who don't have mobile phones uh, or non-heads of households that may not be reached by the surveys that are prioritizing uh, conversations with those household heads. Of course, we need to be monitoring the benefits of these projects, investments, and interventions from a gender perspective. Um, but we don't have to wait, of course, for new data and evidence in order to act. We already have rich evidence that points to the importance, as Patricia and Elizabeth also alluded to, of things like cash transfers and strengthening the enabling environment around ICT and financial services to make those reach and benefit women. Um, very clear evidence that we need to be strengthening labor market policies from a gender perspective, given how few of them have actually been gender sensitive. And that includes providing tailoring support to women-owned firms and women farmers, including by addressing their unpaid care work burdens uh, and supporting the leadership uh, groups, cooperatives, and networks that have promoted resilience during this time. So with that, Greg, I'll hand it back over to you. Thank you, Megan, and, and some really, really tangible insights on practical things we can focus on. And I always love when we get this very sort of uh, nuts and bolts of what needs to be done on the ground. So some, some great, great insights. And remember, this isn't just because uh, women and girls are impacted uh, uh, in an in ac inequitable way as a result of COVID. It's because building back towards a more resilient future demands that we empower women. We know it's an important source of resilience, not just for women, for households, for communities and countries. So some wonderful insights on how we do that, how we build back toward a more resilient future. So wonderful panelists uh, enjoyed each of the three presentations, but now we're uh, to the fun part of the show, which is the uh, question and answer period. And there's been some great uh, questions uh, already put into uh, uh, through, through the various channels I noted, but please continue to submit them and we'll take as many as we can. I'm gonna start with uh, one question directed at Elizabeth. And um, it's actually a, a, there's about three or four versions of the question. Most are from anonymous submitters, uh, but it's really around the asset question, Elizabeth. And uh, a real interest in what type of assets are we talking about in terms of people selling assets uh, as a coping strategy? Um, what type of assets? Uh, do, does that look differently in terms of women and male owned assets? Is there even a division between male and female owned assets or these more household type assets. So Elizabeth, over to you on the asset question. Thanks very much. Yeah, this is a very uh, nuanced result. Unfortunately, because we did this survey over the phone and we wanted to touch on a variety of different issues related to the impacts of COVID-19 on men and women, we didn't get to go into as much detail as we typically would in a household face-to-face -face survey where we would ask about you know, each category of assets, who owns how many, um, and those types of more detailed questions. So we don't have in this particular data set, 
the breakdown of which assets are owned by men and women and which assets get sold. We simply asked whether assets were sold as a coping response and if so, whose assets? And I should note that I didn't present the results of joint assets because we did ask them to specify whether it was their own, their spouses, joint assets or assets of other household members. So we do have a little bit more detail there that I didn't present. Um, but what I can draw on some past research that IFRI has done on um, using assets um, following shocks and stressors. And what we find is that it's really, really mixed. Um, research from Bangladesh and Uganda shows that men and women respond by selling their own assets um, when it comes to different types of shocks differently. So, um, you know, it also depends on the context what assets men and women tend to own. So in Bangladesh, for example, women might own more jewelry, which is easier to sell maybe more quickly if there's an idiosyncratic shock. Um, if there's a covariate shock, like a climate shock, it might be harder to sell certain types of assets. And so, um, what we found there was that you know assets are sold um, following different types of shocks. So if it's a climate shock and men are responsible for agricultural production, so the shock mainly hits their livelihood activity, then they will sell their assets. If it's another type of shock, then women will sell their assets. So it gets very complex in a particular context. And so you have to dig down into a particular context and country and look at what type of shock they're experiencing to see how uh, the gendered, um, assets uh, are, are sold and, and used in response to that shock. Um, so we didn't get that level of detail in this survey, but we do have other data from other previous work that shows how uh, the sort of gender dynamics of asset sales following shocks. No, that's great. I, I, I do think your point about being nuanced, not all assets are created equal. In fact, some people hold some types of assets as a risk management strategy, and that's distinct from when people are selling um, key productive assets that are very difficult and, and sort of trigger that downward spiral. So uh, some great insights there. Uh, Megan O'Donnell, I am going to pose one to you now. Um, what are some of the best practices and examples that really stand out from your research and looking into this amongst governments and donors in terms of responses uh, around this recovery effort that, that really are targeting those working in agriculture? Uh, love your response to that question, Megan. Yeah, absolutely. I'm gonna definitely defer to Patricia on the World Bank, but I can give an example each from the Asian and the African development banks that we also looked at um, with the caveat that this is very much just a first survey. Uh, and I think going forward, we have at least a year you know, to, to continue the work under this COVID-19 gender and development initiative. So we'd really like to take uh, further steps into qualitative assessments of some of these gender analyses that are informing projects um, but for now, I'll stick to the quantitative. So those slides that I showed earlier that demonstrate that just two of the projects we reviewed included indicators that put women's inclusion at parity, at 50% or higher of intended beneficiaries. Those came from an African development project in the CAR um, and an Asian development project in Myanmar. And the former was focused on ensuring that of the farms being targeted uh, with extension services, agricultural inputs, other forms of support, that 50% of those farms would be headed by women. Uh, quite interesting, especially in a context where women are often working, uh, you know, as sort of secondary workers or on their household farms, uh, but may not in fact be the heads of those farms. So that was, was pretty notable. And then the Myanmar project that I mentioned uh, that came out of the Asian Development Bank I thought was pretty impressive from sort of an overarching perspective of, of just how ambitious their intended beneficiary uh, set was. 1.5 million smallholder farmer families who have lost income, uh, whether because of decreased sales or decreased remittances, which we know are a huge risk because of the pandemic are being targeted through this project. 50% of household members within those families working on those farms they said needed to be women. So interesting that they are both uh, setting the ambition to be tracking that data and also to be reaching that many women in contrast to a lot of those targets I had flagged that tend to hover between 10 to 30%. It's, it's very rare to see women called out at parity. 
Oh, great, love those examples. And it's always good to have models to follow. And, and we need to not only identify them, but celebrate them and call attention to them. So thank you for doing just that. Patricia, let's, let's have you piggyback on that question. Maybe uh, uh, give us some insights into one, one or two key areas that you see uh, for building back better in regard to women's empowerment uh, in agricultural systems. Thank you. Um, thanks, Greg. Um, did I unmute myself? Yeah, you're good. Here you go. Sorry, I just got a pop up saying unmute yourself. Um, so, so just um, thank you for that question, Greg. And I just want to just briefly pivot to, to uh, Megan and say that we need to uh, thank you for reminding me to be much better about project documents. Um, <laughs> uh, as if we need to make sure that we can visibly show and include from the, the start. Uh, and not just when a project gets going, uh, the, the intent to, to, to be better about gender targeting and gender sensitive. And that's really important, I think also uh, politically and visually to do that from the start. So that's a really good reminder. Um, it also sort of brings me to the asset question and what would be a really good example, um, which you know we're, we're still trying to build, but it would be a project that, that didn't just do mitigation, um, so it would be the triple win. It wouldn't just mitigate against the shock in terms of food assistance or cash transfers or just immediately um, support to the current planting season. It would be a, it would be an intervention that that invested in the sustainability of women as participants of the food system. So uh, something that added to it, sort of that they would continue to be able to be farmers. So um, something that would stop them from uh, selling their assets. So not just an immediate cash transfer, but something um, more tangible and long-term. So that's sort of what I think is the sort of ideally in my head, the best example. But one or two key areas, and this is all has to feed into this, this, this process, it is the data, the, the visibility of farmers. If we don't um, know where they are and how they're doing and what they're doing, where they're operating, and they are so many invisible women farmers, we can't reach them, we can't uh, support them. And we're missing out uh, on a huge part of, of participants in the food system and, and in therefore food security. So that brings me to my second really key area I think that we can work to in the future, which is um, which is the cost uh, of, I'm sorry, sort of world banky to sort of always think of the cost of something, but the cost of this gender gap and this idea that um, what, are, what, is the, what is the effect of leaving women out of interventions and, and not targeting them properly. What is the cost to the food system and food security? And we've seen now in the pandemic um, and in this last year um, where investments have been uh, leveraged for, for the great and where we have like such in, in India or these investments in, in these self-help groups and women's organization, uh, just the simple thing was really like, um, instrumental in getting food to communities and making sure that perishable crops didn't go to waste in West Africa. But costing out bigger and being able to immediately push um, policy change, and policy change happens <laughs> at the higher level when you give a really good rationale for doing it, and that's often money. Um, what are the costs or the costs to, to food, to people and food security as a whole of not properly um, targeting, accounting for women, recognizing them, uh, getting to where their constraints are is a critical, I think, part of, of how we go forward and really look at the system. Uh, thank you for that. Some great, great insights there. And I, I really do think this uh, women's self-help groups are often dismissed as uh, not a powerful instrument. They're a powerful instrument in this moment. They're a powerful so source of social capital. And uh, uh, a resource that women can lean on in times of need, but also a, a, a body for pooling capital when times are good and investments need to be made. So I think they are really one of these, there's a few things that really jump out in the face of this pandemic and uh, women's self-help groups is, is certainly one of those. So I'm now going to uh, take a, some liberty here and combine uh, two questions. Uh, the, the first part of the question comes from Leonidas. Uh, Dusengemungu, I hope I pronounced that correctly, with the Rwanda Agricultural Board. And uh, Leonidas is asking, income loss was highest in Senegal. And this is to Elizabeth. Why is that? Were there worse COVID impacts or is there another reason? And then the second part of our question comes from USAID's own Ann Swindale asking, is it possible that the percentage experiencing income loss went down in the last round because they had lost income sources 
previously and had no more sources to lose. So Elizabeth's sort of thinking about the challenge of interpreting interpreting some of this data. You know, we didn't we didn't sell any, any assets. Is that because you got better, or is that because you had no assets uh, left to sell? And uh, same with income. So if you could sort of speak to Leonidas and Anne's questions and, and and highlight any insights you have there. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, in fact, in the survey, we specifically asked about income losses due to COVID-19. So I know it's hard uh, sometimes for the respondents to think through the all the multiple factors that might contribute to their income loss, but we did try to single out income losses um, due to COVID-19. Um, so, I mean, we see them pretty high across the board. Um, I think, you know, as you could see from the original table that I presented of how we implemented the surveys, that it, the timing was a little bit different across countries. Um, so, you know, we, you have to take that into consideration as well. Some of them got started a little bit later after the initial shock of the pandemic. Some of them started a bit earlier. In Senegal, the first survey round was carried out in June. So that was the one of the earlier survey rounds that, that we were able to get on the ground quickly. Um, so that might reflect some earlier um, initial shocks from the pandemic where we see um, high income losses in Senegal initially. Um, and then they, they sort of rolled out in different time periods, uh, you know, different intervals over time. So it's, it's very hard. I think we'd have to probably dig down into some of the country level results to look at, you know, when were the different waves of COVID? When did the different policies affect people's economic activities, like things like lockdowns or school closures? And so we can do that as we dig deeper into some of the country level results. We do have some early uh, results from some of the earlier um, countries that we analyzed some of the earlier rounds for on our, our GCAN website. Um, so I can share that link um, in the chat and invite you to go and check that out. And we will be, as I said, doing some deeper dives into each of the country level briefs. Um, and so again, yeah, you know, in general, I, I tried to talk about some of the general trends across countries. So how we saw, um, you know, savings um, tending to be used more in the beginning. And then, you know, I suspect that a lot of those, as those savings get depleted, households then have to rely on some of the other coping strategies like selling assets, which is, or, or, or borrowing, which are tend to be less preferred coping strategies because they do have longer term implications in terms of how to build those back, especially if they're selling productive assets. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll stop there and I'm happy to answer more questions about that, but I would say stay tuned and we will have some more detailed analyses at the country level if you're interested in that. Always leave them wanting more, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, that, that was great. I, it is one of these really intriguing things about um, even in different places, the selling of the same asset has very different meaning in terms of people's perception uh, of, of the point of stress at which they're at. And I think it's, uh, an incredibly interesting uh, area to look at in the face of this shock, but in terms of shocks and stresses more generally. Um, we've got another question here, which is, uh, it's from an anonymous submitter, but I think it's uh, a really insightful question and I'll pose it uh, first to Patricia and uh, would also appreciate Megan Elizabeth's insights on it as well. But it's, it's, it's uh, recognizing that being young adds another layer of invisibility and exclusion in food systems. Beyond women and girls, what are the gendered implications for youth? And don't feel restricted by what you found in your data. Uh, would love your just your perspective based on uh, working in this field. So let's start with uh, Patricia and then Megan, you can follow on Patricia. And Elizabeth, if you have something to add, please jump in after that. Patricia, over to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no, I think that's a super question because it, the impacts on, on youth are, are huge as well. And some of these are the same uh, as for, for, for women and the gender, the, the, you know, the, 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 invis the, the, the constraints to, to getting jobs, to owning land, for example, to, uh, to, to being uh, recognized, to, to, sort of, to also getting to formal um, financing, to, to be integrated into systems already. Because um, we respond to these these, these crises uh, through through systems, and if we're in, if you're not in the system, if you're not, um, it's very hard to get at you. So some of these responses, um, which we, we we sort of considered for women, are ones that can be tailored for youth too, such as like acknowledging informality still, uh, and and but mostly and a lot 
the big problem for youth was just sort of also keep continuing to create jumps, um, not just immediately cash transfers, but sort of have responses that were sustainable in the long term by um, by helping jobs survive, by creating jobs in the rural sector, um, but by also just investing in uh, in in the sector that would be <laughs> continuing. So those are some of the, the key aspects, but a lot of the, the constraints that women face do apply to youth too. And I think it's it's super important to, to continue to focus on that. I would absolutely echo that. I think, you know, two, two reflections to the question. The first is, even while we're waiting for COVID specific data to be available, what we've done is go backwards to past uh, health crises and other economic crises. And that very rich kind of historical database uh, suggests that there will certainly be intergenerational and intercohort effects. And so when we're thinking about the gender dimensions of this crisis, I think it's critical um, to see the contrast, you know, in something like a role model effect where ordinarily, right, we have papers out of South Asia where women sort of flooded the labor force, started to, to get paid for the work they were doing, invested that money in the education of girls as children. And so you have this sort of year on year, generation on generation virtuous cycle. Right now, what we anticipate is the opposite, right? Is the COVID pandemic bringing not only women out of the labor force and girls out of schools temporarily, um, but what impact does that have in sort of a reverse role model effect, where as it's harder for women to re-enter the workforce, uh, that will have implications not only in the short term for what they can invest in the human capital of girls as, as their daughters, as children, uh, but that, that modeling or lack thereof is critical. When we think about that as the problem, I think the second reflection is that it's, it's important to think about how policymakers and donors these global decision makers are thinking intersectionally in the solutions, right, in their response and recovery efforts. And I didn't highlight it in the initial presentation, but we also did some analysis on the extent to which intersectional data is being called for or intersectional targets are being set. Um, and unfortunately, whereas we were very pleased to see that about 85% of economic recovery projects had gender specific indicators or targets, that number drops pretty radically to just 27% that set intersectional targets. Where we see them, they tend to be the intersection of gender and age, which is positive and I think gets back to the original question, a little bit around migrant status um, or disability status reflected as well. But we definitely need to be collecting the data that can then shed light on the problem um, if we are to address it effectively. I, I don't have too much to add to what's already been said. I think you know, definitely Megan is right. We don't have a lot of data on, you know, sort of age disaggregated data on the impacts of these kinds of shocks. And we do need to, to sort of build that data so that we can better target interventions and policies to address the particular challenges that youth face. I would expect youth to um, face similar challenges to women in that they have uh, less resilience capacities. They may start out with lower levels of savings. They may start out with fewer assets, for example, you know, less access to land and things like that. Um, at the same time, they might have some capacities that could be taken advantage of, you know, better ability to navigate digital worlds um, and things like that, that, that we might want to tap into in response to these types of crises where people are doing things a lot more virtually and, and youth may have particular advantages there. So again, we need more data to really address the areas of, of need where youth might be at a disadvantage, but also to take advantage of opportunities where we find them. No, I think that's great. I think meeting youth where they are aspirationally is critically, critically important. And part of this is vision towards building back towards a more resilient future is taking that in, into account. It's gonna be critical. There's one more question from uh, the audience from Rich Ratich from Woreda in South Sudan. And it's an excellent question and it highlights something that I, I really see as a priority. And the question is, women impacted by COVID-19 need some, uh, need some, hold on one second, scrolled past it. <laughs> women impacted by COVID-19 need some form of uh, graduation to resilience model 
what's the best fit for women in dynamic contexts like South Sudan? And so what Rich is talking about is this economic inclusion. It used to be called graduation, but it's this really incredible body of work that even pre-pandemic was critically important and sort of making sure we don't leave anybody behind. And I've actually written a little bit about how it's one of the, uh, one of the few uh, programs that explicitly seeks to build social capital, women's empowerment, confidence, uh, agency, and all these things we know now matter so much for resilience. So thanks for the question, Rich. And uh, let's again go in that same order for uh, responses uh, from the group. But what role do you see uh, economic inclusion graduation programming, in particular to Rich's question, what does that look like in the South Sudan in, in these complex risk environments? Well, it's not just COVID, but it's conflict and it's uh, accelerating climate impacts and this sort of uh, triple, flat, uh, triple threat that I've often talked about. Uh, let's uh, start with you, Patricia, and let's go the same order. I'm really sorry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't quite understand the question or what graduation model is. I'm so sorry. So maybe we can start in the opposite and then I'll, I'll, I'll get into what it means. Sorry. It's another part of the World Bank, <laughs> I suppose, but uh, let's go ahead and uh, offer anybody who wants to offer insights, please jump in. Elizabeth, do you want to start? Should I? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, um, I think this goes back to um, what Patricia raised earlier about women's economic empowerment and women's e empowerment in general. I think if, you know, during good times, we are investing in women so that they're able to build savings, they're able to accumulate assets, um, they're able to participate more in decisions, they are able to join groups and have that social capital built, that when we are hit with these kinds of shocks like COVID, they'll be in a much better position in terms of how they can cope with it, how they can contribute to coping responses, but also to shape those coping responses. Um, we don't want, um, you know, I think it's, we talked about assets and how, you know, women may have more liquid assets can, that can be more easily sold and that we want to protect productive assets because those are really beneficial to the household. But we don't, also don't wanna just raise the asset gap between men and women's assets. So we have to try and, and build women's assets, you know, have women um, actively participating in economic activities, having greater control over income so that they can save money so that when we are hit with shocks, they're not getting disadvantaged more than men and that the asset, the gender gap is growing. Um, so I think, yeah, it's, it's difficult now that we're in the midst of this crisis to think about, um, you know, we have to do immediate relief efforts, but I think long-term we have to think about women's empowerment within food systems and really strengthening the base that they're starting with so that when we are hit with the next shock and it could be climate shock, it could be conflict, it could be something else because we know that the next shock is gonna come, they're already in a better position to be able to handle that. So um, I'll turn it over to um, Patricia or Megan if they wanna jump in and add anything. So I think this is an area where, as I ended very quickly by saying, we don't have to wait to get more data and evidence, right? We can harness what we already have. I think this question speaks really nicely to that because even absent uh, a global health crisis like COVID, drawing upon evidence from fragile states, humanitarian conflicts, other areas where we really needed to promote resilience in, in a comprehensive way, um, there was already very rich understanding coming out of the Africa Gender Innovation Lab on evaluations like the BRAC programs, for example, uh, and JPAL and IPA and others, that if you are seeking to support women uh, sort of at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, with, with very uh, sort of low income generation opportunities at baseline, low skills, et cetera, a silver bullet approach, right? Whether it's just a one-off cash transfer or microcredit or a training program that's very short in duration won't move the needle, right? The, the effects will not be sustained. You might as well, from a cost effectiveness perspective, avoid that kind of one-off intervention. And instead, this more sort of sustained bundled approach that graduation harnesses where you're combining the asset transfer with the training, with the peer and mentorship opportunities, et cetera, is much more likely, even though it seems costly in isolation, to be cost-effective in the long run because impacts are, are rendered and sustained. 
Um, so I would, I would say, yes, absolutely. It's going to be critical to harness some of these short-term policy levers of choice, like cash transfers, um, and make sure that they're not temporary and make sure that they're not uh, sort of one-off and done in isolation without thinking about that broader environment. I'd say one piece to really prioritize top of mind is, of course, the unpaid care work burdens that women and girls disproportionately shoulder. Um, all well and good to do training, but women have higher rates of attrition when a public works program or a financial literacy program isn't designing for and around childcare considerations. Uh, so, so that I think will be top of mind going forward as well. No, that's great. And for those who haven't seen it, I'm going to do a little promotion for uh, the State of Economic Inclusion Report 2021, Moving to Scale is an excellent resource on the learning that's happened. Uh, Megan cited some of it, but really, it, when you do the cost benefit, you need to understand what the cost of not making those investments is. And it's huge in terms of uh, protracted humanitarian assistance, in terms of uh, people staying on social assistance long term. So this is the, one of the key tools I see uh, in the wake of COVID-19 in terms of reaching down and making sure that people are positioned to take advantage of a, a recovering economy and absolutely central that economic inclusion piece. Uh, to, uh, to building a more resilient future. And it really, it's worth everybody taking a look because it is really one of the few sets of activities that embody that notion that the sources of resilience not only cut across sectors, they actually transcend sectors. So I encourage you to take a look at that. So I'm gonna give each uh, panelist 30 seconds to offer uh, some last reflections and thoughts on the discussion today. Very much appreciated your presentations, your answers to the questions and answers. And I thank you to the audience for great questions. You're never sure what kind of questions you're gonna get, but we got some great ones today. But let's go ahead and uh, reverse order. And Megan, we'll start with you, then Patricia, and, and then go to Elizabeth. Over to you, Megan. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, I think I would just to sum up, say quickly that Elizabeth's presentation and evidence that we're seeing coming out of other uh, research institutions really highlight the scale of the problem. Then when we contrast that with government response to date and the extent to which it has or has not been gender sensitive, it still leaves a lot to be desired. We are not matching sort of the gendered nature of this crisis with a gender sensitive response. Now where we're really encouraged based on our initial analysis is that when MDBs are involved, we see a higher rate of gender sensitivity. We see those indicators and those targets being integrated and set. So I think that is where uh, bilateral donors like the United States need to continue to support these MDBs who really can be a catalyst for inclusive recovery, um, but only, only with sort of that strong linkage to government to nudge them in the right direction. I'll jump straight in. Um, thank you so much. And I think it's also to my, my final thoughts and sort of what, what we need is it also um, it touches a little bit on the last question, which I finally kind of understood as well <laughs> and where I was phrased, is that we need to invest in, in all the causes and constraints of the gender gap to really in understanding it um, to be able to address it. Um, because we need to get at also the deep structural issues that affect women's participation in the food system. Like, the data, the land title, the laws, the enabling environment, where are we, where, where, where do women access worse, where do they fare worse, but also institutionally from a regulatory perspective, because if we don't look at this, um, the brunt of shocks to the food system will continue to be borne uh, by women. So we need to invest in resilience, but also, and what we've done right, but also the potential for the food system to empower a women and to give women additional voice in it. So that's a much bigger picture than just the essential key fixes that we approach today, but really investments in women from a human capital perspective, but also from the gender gaps, such as, as you mentioned, their care burdens, the inputs, their land rights, uh, their access to education and literacy, which all factor into their ability to be not only resilient, um, uh, participants in the food system, but contributors and have the food system be uh, a, a place for them to be empowered. So it's a much bigger picture that we need to understand uh, and get data on. And we're, we're getting there, but it, it predates COVID-19. So thank you. Sir.
Thanks. Um, yeah, I would just like to piggyback on what Megan was saying. I think uh, what we need to do going forward is to really marry the, the data uh, on how women are affected by this crisis with the kinds of policy and programmatic responses. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, we really should um, go beyond just reaching women and targeting women, but also making sure that programs and policies are designed in such a way that women benefit from them and also have opportunities to become empowered by these types of interventions. Um, you know, I like what Patricia was saying in her presentation about how the bank really took advantage of existing programs on the ground, like water users associations, getting really creative about what is the infrastructure that we already have in place to support women and how can we use those resources now to really effectively reach them, benefit them and empower them. And I think that, you know, those kinds of creative solutions are really needed now um, to be able to, to sort of not just you know, target the number of women that, that are, you know, receive a transfer, but also then think about those programs that can really build them back up, help build their assets, help increase their agency and decision-making and really uh, set them up to be stronger the next time we, we face a challenge like the one we're in now. So I think I'll stop there and uh, thanks very much to all of you for listening today. Well, that's great, Elizabeth. And I think if there's one takeaway, uh... Spoiler alert, I had this takeaway before COVID, but uh, is we cannot be thinking of our investments, our activities, our programming in terms of operating in a static environment in which no shock will occur within the, uh, within the implementation period. Shocks and stresses are occurring throughout the implementation, implementation period. All activities need to be designed to be shock responsive and to be part of the response. Long gone are the days where that's the humanitarian job and this is a development job the impacts of COVID-19, climate change and accelerated impacts from that, conflict, locus, you name it, this is accelerating. We've got to be uh, equipped to adapt and respond uh, and use the very market systems, uh, the very groups uh, that we're creating for long-term development as part of the response rather than undermining them. So some great uh, insights there. So it's my job now to just say thank you, thank you, thank you to the panelists. I uh, love the starting out with the data. I love starting my day with data, Elizabeth. It's wonderful. And then wonderful policy and programmatic insights uh, from Patricia and Megan as well. I also want to give a shout out to Katarla Taylor. She's on the back end of this production, and I've never been so well organized as a moderator. Uh, bravo. <laughs> I felt in such good hands, Katarla. So thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, and of course, thank you to IFPRI and the World Bank for co-sponsoring this uh, with, with USAID and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security. And last but not least, I want to invite all of you to join IFPRI next Thursday, April 1st at 9.30, no joke, <laughs> it is April 1st, for the next seminar on tackling child undernutrition at scale, insights from national and subnational success cases. And that proves to be, is going to prove to be a great event as well that I know my my colleague, the chief nutritionist at USA, Sean Baker, will, will certainly force us all to attend, so I'll be there. All right, everybody, thank you so much, and have a 